Well, welcome everybody to the next installment of our Air Miners event series. It's very good to see so many people here. Uh, we have a great, great presentation. Hello, Tito. We've got Claire Colster, David Burton here. I'll uh, be doing a little bit of introduction in a, in a minute. Uh, my name is Jason Grillo, the event director for Air Miners. And this is a fantastic uh, topic. We've got about 45Q tax credits, which is of keen interest to many in Air Miners, which prompted us to host the session today. Uh, before we get started, though, I, I just wanted to pause for a moment and uh, talk and uh, say that uh, we are all thinking about people whose lives have been affected by the intense wildfires in Northern California. And to uh, say that our heart, thank you for sharing the Golden Gate Bridge, Tito, uh, to say that we are, uh, we are th those of us who are not in the Bay Area are thinking of folks who are in Northern California, knowing that people who live in that region are in particular a uh, very large constituency of our air miners community. So uh, thoughts going out, including to, in particular, uh, Diego Sayez Gill, the CEO, CEO of Pachama, whose house, uh, unfortunately, uh, burned down this past weekend. And uh, Tito is going to share the Medium post that Diego wrote about his experience and how he's uh, steeling himself to uh, be even more dedicated to the cause of stopping climate change, which uh, to me is one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing, uh, that preventing a disaster such as this from taking place. Um, so again, thinking of everyone whose lives have been affected. Uh, to that end, uh, we've got 45Q on our mind as well, in that uh, these tax incentives can catalyze the development of carbon removal technologies that will hopefully stave off the worst of climate change. Uh, for that, we've got, uh, like I said, David's here. Would like to introduce now Dr. Clea Colster from uh, Lower Carbon Capital. She's the director of science there. She has a venture capital fund that focuses on early stage investments in technologies and solutions that reduce carbon emissions from the hardest to abate sectors, remove carbon dioxide emissions from the emissions from the atmosphere and oceans, or reduce warming effect of greenhouse gas emissions. Prior to joining Lower Carbon, Clea was a consultant at E3, an energy consulting firm in San Francisco, which focused on developing economy-wide decarbonization strategies for state agencies and utilities with a focus on emerging, emerging technologies. Clea holds a PhD in energy system engineering from Imperial College London, where she focused on the techno-economics required for large-scale deployment of carbon capture and storage, and spent nine months at Stanford collaborating with academics on policy and cost modeling for carbon capture technologies. She's spoken at a number of international conferences and at the Stanford Energy Seminar. And she also holds a master's and bachelor's in chemical engineering from Imperial College London. With that, I'll leave it to Clea. Oh, but before we go any further, to let you know, we'll have the presentation by David, then we'll have Q&A, and then we will, at the top of the hour, pause for uh, networking for another 10, 15 minutes after that. So, Clea. Great. Age Thanks, Jason. Um, thank you for the introduction. Very excited to be here and very excited to be hearing from David Burton from Norton Rose Fulbright, uh, a global law firm that has provided a lot of thought leadership in the energy project finance space, and in particular on renewable energy project finance structures. David advises clients on U.S. tax matters with an emphasis on project finance and energy transactions. He has extensive experience structuring tax efficient transactions for wind and other renewables, with particular expertise regarding flip partnerships and sale leasebacks. David also advises on tax aspects of the formation and structuring of private equity funds with particular expertise regarding renewable energy investment funds. He is ranked in the legal power list, A World About Wind, and the Chambers USA Nationwide uh, Renewables and Alternative Energy. David is also the editor of taxequitynews.com um, that covers US renewable energy and, and tax policy. So I know our audience in the carbon capture utilization and carbon removal space are getting excited about the prospect of 45Q um, carbon tax credit. And we're really excited to hear from you, David, um, on how that tax, what that tax credit could mean for these entrepreneurs and organizations and how they could benefit from it. So I'll hand it over to you, David. Thank you, Clive. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, nice to see all these uh, bright and shiny faces. Um, 
Uh, we're going to go through uh, some um, information about Section 45Q to give you some background and some, some of the rules and talk about some examples as to how it could be possibly used uh, you know, to finance uh, uh, carbon sequestration um, technology and improvements. The, uh, the history of Section 45Q. So Section 45Q uh, was first enacted in 2008, but it could only be claimed on the first 75 million metric tons uh, nationwide of uh, carbon dioxide sequestered. Uh, therefore, it did not uh, attract much interest because you could find yourself investing a lot of money in carbon capture equipment to earn these tax credits. And then the IRS puts out a notice saying all the, all the um, credits have been claimed and there's none left for you. So it, it was not uh, very user friendly and was really only used by um, uh, uh, taxpayers that were otherwise going to be cap capturing carbon. That there was a sort of something we we're going to do otherwise and it's kind of an upside for them. But it wasn't something that was going to really motivate somebody to do you know, something that wasn't part of their business because they could get started and then find out the credits had all been exhausted by somebody else. In uh, 2018, the rules were expanded. So Congress dropped the cap, which was critical. Uh, they it increased the credit amount and allowed the tax credits to be claimed for 12 years after the capture equipment is first placed in service. So that, that was very important. Um, we, uh, we received uh, re proposed regulations from the Treasury earlier this year. And actually today, there is a hearing on those proposed regulations giving taxpayers an opportunity uh, to comment. So it's, it's, uh, our, uh, our webinar today is very timely given, given that hearing. So next slide. So section 45Q raises two broad questions. What must be done to qualify for the tax credits? Um, and once qualification is assured, how can the tax credits be converted into current cash in the tax equity market to help pay for the project? So those are kind of the two broad things we're gonna be talking about today. Next slide. There's three things that must happen to qualify for um, these tax credits. You must have a qualified facility that is a source of the emissions. You must add capture equipment, and then you must dispose of the CO2. Um, the, the statute refers to carbon oxide. Uh, in the pitch, I'm generally using the term CO2, just to keep it simple. But it, it, in fact, in 2018, was expanded to be carbon oxide generally. Most of the interest uh, I hear about it is in a CO2 context, but I'm sure some of you have ideas about how to uh, capture carbon oxide. So next slide. Um, there are three deadlines to do certain things. Um, uh, the tax credit amount and how long the tax credit runs depends on when and how these items fall into place. There are three allowed uses of the uh, capture uh, uh, CO2. You can uh, dispose of it in secure geological storage. You can use it as a tertiary injectant um, for um, natural gas uh, exploration um, and then dispose of it in secure geological storage, or you can use it in another qualifying manner, which are specified as conversion into an organic compound by growing algae or bacteria. Uh, chemical conversion to material or compound in which carbon oxide is securely stored or another purpose designated by the IRS. Um, so you have to, to use one of, one of these three means. It's, it seems pretty obvious. The, um, I haven't heard much discussion about um, conversion into uh, algae or bacteria yet, but that may be a, a, an opportunity for somebody to figure out. So then you have, next slide, you have to have a qualified facility. Uh, this gets a little bit complicated, um, so we'll, I'll try to go through it uh, slowly. So you, you have to be sure you have a qualified facility. So the first category for qualified facility is your facility emits up to 500,000 metric tons of CO2 a year, and um, at least 25,000 tons are put into commercial use. Uh, so commercial use means making something that there is a commercial market for. Um, this generally, this, this category generally is industrial facilities. Uh, the next category is a power plant that emits 500,000 metric tons or more of CO2 a year. And then the last one is any other facility, 
which is generally going to be a direct air capture facility um, that emits at least 100,000 metric tons of CO2 a year. Uh, so you have to fit into one of these three buckets. Uh, the rules favor large tax, large projects. Um, these, these metrics are pretty high, uh, and, and a lot of smaller projects are not going to meet them. Uh, one of the um, areas covered in comments on the proposed regulations uh, is, the, is the, ability, the ability to aggregate smaller projects together to meet these standards. Uh, so it's, it's that ability to uh, to aggregate is important to some taxpayers who have smaller projects and want to be able to combine them to meet these standards, or otherwise we're not going to qualify uh, for the tax credits. Uh, it, I don't know for sure, but it seems likely, you know, somebody at a major, you know, oil uh, company, a lobbyist, may have, may have suggested these standards to kind of take the, uh, the smaller players out of it and kind of say, this is just for us big companies with big projects. But uh, but, but, you know, that, I don't know that for sure, but it has that flavor. Uh, so uh, next slide. Um, the captured carbon must be CO2 that would otherwise be released to the atmosphere as an industrial emission of greenhouse gas or lead to such release. Um, but this does not apply to a direct air capture facility. So if you're doing direct air capture, you don't have to meet this requirement. But if you're not doing direct air capture, so if you're an industrial facility or a power plant, um, you do. Uh, so just that's an important, uh, uh, important part of the rules. So next slide. Uh, <clears throat> an industrial facility does not include a facility that produces CO2 uh, from CO2 production wells at natural carbon dioxide bearing formations. So uh, if, the, if the CO2 is otherwise going to be released, um, it, do, it doesn't qualify as, a, as an industrial facility. Obviously, it's not a power plant, and it wouldn't be direct air capture because you're not um, taking the CO2 out of the air. Um, uh, so this is, a, you know, this is a wrinkle that you need to think about if you're planning to take the CO2 out of the ground um, uh, of, of a natural uh, formation. Okay, next slide. Uh, a manufacturing process, process can be in an industrial facility. So an industrial facility must produce CO2 from a fuel combustion source or a fuel cell or a manufacturing process. So a fuel combustion source or a fuel cell or a manufacturing process. Um, one of the comments uh, to the proposed regulations is does a fuel combustion source mean that it has to be um, producing uh, 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 useful uh, power or, um, or, or electricity, uh, you know, useful motion or electricity. Uh, so for instance, um, if, you're, if you're flaring landfill gas, that's combustion, but is that a fuel combustion source? That's one of the comments uh, uh, to the proposed regulations is about flaring landfill gas. So if you're gonna flare landfill gas, you're combusting it, um, and that taxpayer is asking for clarification that that combustion counts um, even though it's not uh, combustion for um, a mechanical or electrical purpose. Uh, the other uh, um, requirement is manufacturing uh, process must involve manufacture of a product other than CO2 that is intended to be sold at a profit or used for a commercial purpose. So you say, oh, I'm manufacturing CO2 and I'm gonna sell that, that doesn't qualify as, um, as, an, industrial, um, as, as an industrial facility. Uh, so let's keep moving. Uh, start a construction deadline. This is very important. The, uh, the industrial facility must be under construction by the end of 2023. Uh, the capture equipment must be under construction by the same deadline or be part of the original planning and design for the industrial facility that was under construction by the end of 2023. Uh, so the IRS has published some pretty generous rules about how to define um, start of construction and it's not you know, the sort of uh, natural um, uh, de definition that, you know, you would think about if you were in grade school as to what it means to start construction. But you don't have to have, you know, yellow equipment and hard hats to start construction. One way you can do it is by spending 5% um, of the cost um, and uh, of the project, or the other way is you do what's called significant uh, physical work, uh, uh, which is, a very technical definition will spare you, but just, just keep in mind that, um, you know, you can work with uh, uh, a lawyer 
uh, to figure out under these rules how to start construction without you know having you know cranes and uh, bulldozers uh, at the site. It's, it, the rules are more generous than that. Okay, next slide. Carbon capture equipment of a taxpayer must own uh, all the components of the property used to capture or process CO2 until the CO2 is transported for disposal, ejection, or use. Um, so um, this is uh, you know, kind of a basic uh, definition, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, uh, oftentimes I'm asked the question, uh, do, do trees count as carbon capture equipment? Um, and you know, uh, maybe, maybe they should, and maybe that's a good policy, uh, but they don't meet this definition. So if you want to uh, use trees to uh, ca capture and dispose of carbon, uh, you, we would need a new tax credit for that. And that would have to be a new, a new statute. Under this statute, it doesn't qualify, although I understand the compelling uh, policy reasons why, why one would want uh, an incentive to do that. So uh, the next slide, please. <laughs> so the included components, uh, I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but property necessary to compress, treat, process, liquefy, pump, or perform some other physical action to capture qualified carbon dioxide. So then there's this long list. Um, and again, you see that trees are, are not in the list, uh, but there's this long list of stuff that, that, uh, that, that, that is uh, carbon capture equipment. Then the next slide, excluded components. Um, you don't have to own the pipelines, the branch lines, or land and marine transport vessels used for transporting the captured CO2 for disposal, ejection, or use. Um, so, uh, so that that and that was uh, that's that's a bit of uh, of uh, generosity on the part of the uh, Treasury there to to not require ownership of those things. There was some concern that you'd have to own the pipeline, you know, all the way to the um, you know, to, to the, where it's geologically uh, disposed of, but, but you don't have to, just the, just the equipment that's involved in the capture. So the next slide. Uh, another uh, liberalization um, in the, uh, um, in the new statute uh, from 2018 was that the taxpayer that owns the carbon capture equipment doesn't have to claim the credits. So the credits could be passed um, to the taxpayer that's um, disposing of the CO2. Uh, so you could have one taxpayer who owns the carbon capture equipment, another taxpayer doing the disposal, um, and the tax credits could be passed to the other taxpayer. The election to pass the credits to the party doing the disposal um, uh, is very flexible. You can pass uh, uh, you know, any percentage you want, and it's year by year. So, you know, one year it can be 50-50, the next year it can be 75-25, the next year it can be 100-0. So it's, it's, it's very flexible. Obviously, if you're entering into an arrangement, um, counting to share these credits between the party who owns the capture equipment and the party uh, doing the disposal, you would want a contract that says, okay, you know, here's how, you know, in these years, here's how we're going to allocate them between, between ourselves. You wouldn't want to just leave that open-ended. But the, but the proposed uh, regulations and the statute even uh, make that pretty flexible, which is, which is nice. Okay, next slide. All right, actually I, I just covered this. This is the annual election and the flexibility. So next slide, okay. Now, now getting down to dollars. Um, so, uh, so the tax credit amount for equipment placed in service on or after February 9th, 2018 is, um, <clears throat> $31.77 with scheduled increases through 2026, ending at $50. Um, so so, it's, so it's, it's ramping up to $50, it'll get there in 2026, but this is only if it's not used as a tertiary injectant. So this, you have to not be using this for uh, injecting into you know, uh, natural gas ex exploration. Uh, uh, if you are going to use it as a tertiary ejectant, there's still a pretty generous tax credit, but it's a lower amount. So it, right now it's twenty dollars and twenty-two cents, and it ramps up to thirty-five dollars. Um, so that's if it, you do use the tertiary injection disposal uh, method. Uh, so uh, the credit period is twelve years. Um, so pretty long time to earn these credits, and the construction of the facility must begin before twenty twenty-four. Um, so. 
that role. Then, then we get into an example. Uh, so here we go. So here's an example. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I wanted to give people a tangible example so that they could see it and kind of put some reality to this and not just a whole bunch of, you know, kind of rules and, and definitions and things and, and, and make this tangible to people. Uh, but I, I want you to keep in mind this was, uh, you know, this is just one way to do it. Um, this is not, uh, you know, a fixed blueprint of, you know, this is the only way it works. You have to do it this way. This is this is one way to do it. Um, as just an example, uh, and I tried to kind of use things that were relatively um, uh, uh, objective and relatively conservative uh, in terms of assumptions here. So, uh, so I'm proposing in this example that we've got CO2 captured at a power plant. So that means the minimum of uh, metric tons of captured CO2 is 500,000. So I just use the minimum of 500,000 every year because if you weren't going to meet that, you wouldn't be trying to qualify for tax credit. So I thought that was pretty safe. And then I'm assuming it's used as a tertiary injectant, so it qualifies for the lower tax credit. So it, it maxes out at $35 rather than $50. So just I just was trying to be conservative. Um, so if you generate the minimum number of metric tons of captured CO2 and you use the tertiary injecting uh, level of credit, you come up um, for the 12 year period, assuming uh, you know, that you start uh, next year. At in, um, you, you come up with, um, uh, you, come up, you come up with almost 37 million. Um, so you almost 37 million in total tax credit value. Uh, so that that's a lot of that's a lot of economics, uh, thirty-seven million dollars. Then the next slide, um, I'll have an example is an example of uh, how how one could try to monetize that through um, uh, a tax equity partnership. Um, so we're going to spend some time on this slide. There's there's a lot going on, um, and I, and I want to kind of go through it slowly and and make sure people follow it. Again, the caveat that this is just one way to do it. Um, so I don't want, you are all very creative, smart people. I don't want you to think, oh, this is the only way to do it. Um, this is one way to do it. There's almost numerous uh, variations and, and flexibility as to how this works. So let, let's start across the bottom of the slide with just sort of the, the basic facts. So we, we know in the lower left-hand corner, we have an industrial facility, which in this example is a coal plant. Um, then the coal plant enters into a contract to provide emissions uh, to the carbon capture equipment, the owner of the carbon capture equipment, who then enters into a contract for its transport and disposal. So goes from the carbon capture equipment into a pipeline. The pipeline goes to a natural gas field uh, owned by a gas company, and it gets injected and disposed of, you know, stored um, in that natural gas field. So that's kind of the, um, you know, the, the physical uh, process here. Um, and, then, and then we have this uh, green triangle in the middle, and that's kind of the, uh, uh, the engine of this transaction, the heart of the transaction. Um, so I call it CDR, Tax Equity Partnership, LLC, and it owns the carbon capture equipment, right? Um, and it is not going to pass the tax credit to somebody else who's disposing of it, Rather, it's going to keep it itself. So it's going to keep the, the tax the the, uh, the tax credit itself and allocate it to its partners. So it's got one partner who's I'm calling Tax Equity Investor Inc. That's typically a bank or insurance company. Uh, typically, uh, 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 banks and insurance companies are involved in this because they have you know kind of what I think of as the three requirements uh, to be a tax equity investor. First of all, they have corporate tax appetite. So it's very difficult. I have done it, but it's very difficult for individuals to use tax credits. So uh, you generally need it to be a C corporation. Um, and the only reason to be a C corporation is to be publicly traded or a bank uh, or an insurance company. Uh, so you, you know, if, if you're setting up a, a small business or a family owned business these days, you're not gonna set it up as a C corporation. Really, the only reason to do that is to be publicly traded bank or insurance company. Um, and then banks and insurance companies have money to invest, and they have sufficient sophistication to 
understand these complicated tax rules and the um, and the and the tax credits and the uh, and the underlying engineering involved. So those are really the three things: tax appetite, money to invest, and sophistication to understand the tax and other um, technological uh, 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 information involved to understand this. The other side of the green triangle is uh, the managing member, who I've called carbon entrepreneur here. So uh, when I look at it, all these uh, shiny faces, I'm thinking of you guys uh, in that box. Um, so you're a, you're a carbon entrepreneur who doesn't have tax appetite uh, and wants to um, you know, monetize uh, tax credits in order to raise money uh, for you know, a carbon capture project. So there's this partnership and how do we share these things? So uh, you see these numbers, they're a little bit complicated. The, the first number is tax p &L, so tax profit and loss. The tax credit's gonna follow the profit and loss. Um, and so the IRS's rules permit 99% of the tax credits to be allocated to the tax equity investor. You can't go over 99. So it's initially 99%. Um, and then the rules require that uh, at the end of the deal, there's sort of like a residual period whereby the tax equity investor have, has to have at least 5%. Um, obviously, the managing member gets the other side of that. So the managing member gets uh, 1% of the tax credits and 95% uh, during the post flip uh, residual period. Uh, the flip refers to uh, achieving an after tax rate of return. So upon the tax equity investor achieving an after tax rate of return, its share of the tax PL drops from 99% to 5%. And accordingly, the uh, managing member share flips up. Uh, tax tax PL is divorced from cash. So, you know, oftentimes you think of uh, profit as the same as cash, but here there are not. So, for instance, you know, the partnership could have uh, $100 loss, but have, you know, $200 of cash. And then, then the $100 loss and the tax credits would go 99% to the tax equity investor, and then the cash would be split based on these ratios. Um, the, the rules are pretty flexible. They don't, they don't specify a maximum or a minimum of amount of cash before the flip that the uh, tax equity investor has to have. And certainly there are deals where the tax equity investor at times takes all the cash or none of the cash. Um, so there's some flexibility there. So that's why I put X. So the taxable investor before the flip, before achieving its after-tax rate of return, uh, gets X percent of the cash. Obviously, the managing member gets 100% minus X. And then after the flip, the taxable investor gets 5%, and the managing member gets 95%. Um, so what this does is it allows the uh, managing member to um, end up with 95% of the project um, but having monetized 99% of the tax credits. Uh, so it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty efficient um, way to, uh, to, to extract value from tax credits that you cannot necessarily use yourself. Um, so a lot going on in this slide. I, I hope it's a helpful example. Again, there's other ways to do it. You can pass the tax credits through the party disposing it. Um, you don't have to do a partnership. You could have a direct ownership arrangement. There's some leasing that would possibly work. So, you know, this is not uh, this is not supposed to be set in stone and rigid. And then the next slide um, goes through how much money the tax equity investor is going to put in. So, uh, so the, the 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 revenue procedure 2020-12 is where the IRS spells out these rules about tax equity partnerships for Section 45Q, and it says. That, um, uh, that, that no more than 99% of a tax credit be allocated with tax of the investor, as I said, um, and that um, uh, no more than 50% of a tax of the investor's capital can be contingent. Um, that is double what Wynn gets. Uh, so Wynn gets only 25% um, contingent, uh, but the IRS was more lenient uh, here, probably because there's more technological uh, uncertainty and variation then with wind and said, okay, you can make 50% contingent. So what that means is that 50% of the uh, contribution uh, can be contingent upon performance. So the tax and which isn't great for the 
you know, the sponsors and managing member types, you, you know, who, who want money, but it does give the tax equity investors comfort that, um, that they don't, you know, if the, if the thing doesn't work, they don't have to put their, their money in um, or all their money in. They have to put some of the money in, but they don't have to put all the money in. So if they, if they don't earn their return, if it doesn't produce, they don't have to put money in uh, up to 50%. But then once it hits hurdles uh, and satisfies, you know, production levels, or return levels, uh, then they put more money in. Uh, this concept of contingency is pretty flexible. Sometimes you see it as like a year by year thing. And, it's, and, and it says, well, if a plant produces over this level, then the tax equity investor puts more money in. Or sometimes it's, okay, the tax equity investor, you know, earns a 10% after tax IRR, and the money you put in originally, and then beyond that, you know, it'll put in more money. Um, so it's, it's pretty flexible as to what this contingency can be. But so 50% of the tax equity investor's capital can be contingent. 20% must be paid when the tax of the investor requires its interest, right? So 20% has got to come in up front. Um, and then 30% can be paid after the tax of the investor requires its interest and after the project is placed in service. Um, so it's going to be paid later in time, but it can't be contingent. So it can't be contingent on returns or production levels or efficiency or anything like that, but it doesn't have to be put in all day one. Um, so we have a total tax credit value in the prior slide of over $37 million. 99% gets allocated to the tax equity investors, so that's 37 and change um, for the tax equity investor. Um, and then if the tax equity investor provides one dollar of investment for each dollar of expected credit, here's what it would look like. And you may be thinking, well, why would somebody, what's the economic incentive to, to, to invest a dollar to get a dollar of tax credit? And the, the answer is that you also get um, uh, a, a loss or a deduction for that dollar you invested. So yes, you get a dollar of tax credit, but you also get um, uh, you also get a deduction for it. So at the current 21% um, corporate income tax rate, you get you know uh, an additional 21 cents on every dollar that you put in. Um, uh, so. Um, that, that's why somebody would invest a um, dollar to get a dollar of tax credit. And in the solar market, um, you actually see people investing more than a dollar to get a dollar of tax credit. So you'll see a dollar five, a dollar ten, a dollar twenty, um, again, because they also get the loss. And then usually there is some, some cash as well. Um, so usually you're also going to get some cash. So, if, so we've got 37 and change of tax credits for a tax equity investor. Um, so they would put in at acquisition of their interest, uh, almost seven and a half million dollars. And then 30%, you know, maybe after, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 construction is completed and it's operating. Um, so that would be another 11 million. And then 50% would be contingent. So 50% would be payable upon meeting uh, production or economic or return thresholds. Um, so, so that's kind of how the money, that's how the money would come in. Obviously, you can either use the money to pay expenses, uh, uh, pay for the construction, uh, pay down debt, or you can have the tax of the investor contribute it and then distribute it back out to the managing member to put in their pocket. Um, so, you know, uh, different tax consequences based on how you use the money, but relatively flexible. Uh, so that, that's how the money would come in. So this is, you know, this is uh, an example as to how this could work for, you know, uh, carbon capture on a coal plant that then is used as a tertiary objective. Um, so uh, the, the last point we already talked about that you also get um, uh, the tax deduction for your capital contributed. Um, so that's the other, the other benefits. That's almost another um, $8 million uh, in tax benefit for, from that deduction. So that, that's a lot. Um, all right, the, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so determining the place and service date, which is critical for what level of tax credit you qualify for. Um, if you had uh, an existing um, uh, project um, uh, uh, and you spent at least 80% uh, of the fair market value of the existing project, you would get a new um, um, a new place in service date. So uh, in, in solar and wind, we call this repowering. So if you do a repowering, 
and you put in 80% of the total fair market value, you can have some old equipment. Um, and then certain pre-February 9, 2018 facilities can elect to be treated as placed in service um, on February 9th, 2018, so to qualify for the higher tax credit. Um, but the election only applies to facilities in years at least 500,000 metric tons are captured and must not have claimed credits under the old rules. Uh, so if you claim credits under the old rules, you, you can't do that. But so if you had a carbon capture equipment that wasn't claiming credits under the old rules, but is but but is older, predates the the new law, um, and captured at least 500,000 metric tons, you could make this election and refresh your your place in service date and qualify for uh, new tax credits. And this election doesn't qualify. You don't have to do this 80% uh, spend thing. These are two different options: either 80% spend or this election. Um, Okay, so the next slide. Uh, so the recapture of a tax credit. Um, so the recapture period runs for potentially 17 years. Um, so that's 12 years of the tax credit period plus five years after. Um, so only the net week amount is uh, in a year's recapture. Um, uh, so if, if you have a week in a year where you still are claiming tax credits, you first offset the week against the tax credits you would claim in that year, and then only if the week exceeds um, what, uh, what, you, what you would otherwise come in the year do you have to suffer recapture. And, and just to be clear what recapture is, recapture means repaying the tax credit to the IRS. So it's, it's reversing the tax credit and, and, and repaying it to the IRS. Um, so, uh, and so it's 17 years. So the IRS has said it's only going to look back five years, um, but the tax credit period is 12 years. So for the 12th year, it's going to be year 17 that they can look back. But, you know, um, you, you know, but for the first year, they're only going to, you know, by the time you get to, uh, um, uh, to year six, you know, they'd, you'd be done looking back to the first year. But then, you know, if there was recapture in year seven, you know, years, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, year two would then be exposed to that. So that's, um, so that's how it works. The proposed regulations uh, got a lot of comments on this point of people saying this recapture rule is too tough, uh, it's too long, it's going to deter investment, and that, uh, that it needs to be softened. Um, so it, it's not statutory. The statute just uh, says there's a says there, there'll be recapture doesn't specify rules the, this this 12 plus 5 came from the proposed regulations um, the IRS if it wants to can uh, uh, you know do something else uh, you know 12 plus 1 or um, you know some, some, something like that and, and, and make it uh, less onerous um, and there were a lot of comments uh, asking for this to be softened so next uh, next slide Um, if multiple taxpayers are storing the same underground reservoir, then they'll have to come up with a method to allocate the leaked CO2 among them. Um, so, you know, that, that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty intuitive that if, you know, two different taxpayers are using the same reservoir, you have to figure out how you share it. And then uh, the IRS did say that if the leak is caused by, you know, sort of force majeure, act of God type of thing, like a volcano or an earthquake, that that doesn't trigger recapture. Um, so that, that is, that, that gives you a little bit of comfort, but if it just kind of, you know, leaks out because of, you know, a, 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 a construction defect or something like that, um, there's no relief for that. So, that, so but at least the volcanoes and earthquakes are carved out. All right. Next slide. Um, uh, so then there are some material operational risks to earning the tax credits. Um, the risk is that, you know, the minimum emission levels uh, will not be reached, you know, so if you're a power plant and you're not doing the 500,000, uh, you know, tons, metric tons, you know, that's an issue. Um, or the risk that your, uh, that your source of your carbon dioxide uh, shuts down. So if you're planning to, you know, claim a credit based on emissions from a coal plant and the coal plant gets closed, um, you know, you, you'd be out of luck. So this does have some operational risk. On the, on the topic of operational risk, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's important, um, you, know, you know, it's important to note that there's not currently uh, tax equity investors willing to invest in 45Q. So 
the the uh, uh, the um, the uh, the you know the the tactically investors that invest in wind and solar um, have all said that they're interested in 45Q and they hope they you know maybe get comfortable with it, but none of them are ready to write checks today. Um, so when we when we talk about you know, tax equity monetization and my partnership example, it's a little bit more hypothetical than I would like it to be because the tax equity market is not open to 45Q yet. Um, I'm hoping we see some, you know, energy companies that are comfortable with uh, sequestration and this type of technology and have tax appetite, make some investments, um, but then get the market comfortable and then the banks and insurance companies come along seeing that those investments went well. Uh, but at the moment, um, it, I can't tell you a bank or insurance company that's willing to put money into this, unfortunately. I, I wish that was not the case. Uh, but hopefully there's some market precedent and they, they move along. Okay, next slide. Oh, we're, we're audience questions. So uh, um, so we, we've got time, we've got time for, for questions. Or, could I have, uh, maybe you want to have, have some questions, maybe some questions from our, our moderator. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much, David. That was very comprehensive. Um, so looking through, looking through some of the audience questions, there were a number of um, clarification questions on you know, specific con CO2 conversions that apply. Um, notably on, so I, I know that there's, the CO2 for tertiary injectant, which is specifically for CO2 EOR, uh, qualify, qualifies for that lower uh, tax credit rate. But then if you're capturing CO2 uh, from the air or from a facility and converting that into a fuel that you know, will store the CO2 for a certain amount of time, but then the fuel will be used um, in aviation, for example, would that still qualify? And I think there are a number of questions. So another question would be, you know, where where can where can we find more of this information on the specifics, or is this the kind of thing that we submit to the IRS? Or uh, yeah, well, let's let's talk about you know more information. So uh, the IRS so far is saying they will not issue private letter rulings. So usually or oftentimes when you have novel questions for the IRS and, and you're, you know, there's not a clear answer, a clear guidance, you can go to them and it's a long and expensive process, but you can go to them and say, hey, will you, uh, will you issue uh, you know, uh, private letter rulings? Uh, will you issue me a ruling that, that answers this question? Um, and then six months after you get the ruling, um, it's made public in redacted form. So they take out your, your name and details but it is, it is released to the public. So everybody knows what these rulings are. They're not secret. Um, but the IRS is saying at the moment, they're not willing to rule in this area. Um, typically, the IRS says that they don't um, rule uh, when they have open, an open regulation project. And so since they're in the middle of um, you know, going from proposed to final regulations, they're saying, well, rulings would just distract us. Um, so we won't, um, we, we won't rule. We won't issue rulings. So there's not really a good way to get formal uh, official guidance from the IRS. Um, you know, ob obviously other sources of information are the proposed regulations. Uh, at some point we'll get final regulations. And then, um, you know, I and others uh, have, have written about, you know, those regulations in these matters. Um, I try to keep my, my blog, uh, uh, Tax Equity News, uh, you know, relatively current with uh, updates on 45Q. So there's some information there. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, but it's a, you know, it's a matter of, uh, of, um, uh, of, you know, trying to read between the lines as best you can. And that, that generally you're going to need a lawyer to help you with that. And the lawyer may very well say, well, there's, there's not an answer, um, which is frustrating, mm -hmm. but, um, that does happen. Um, in terms of fuel, fuel, yeah, you can, you can, uh, you know, that you, you can take the, uh, the, the, the carbon dioxide and turn it into, uh, you know, and turn it into fuel, um, and you know, and that and that qualifies. So that that uh, that it, that's a qualifying activity. Um, Great, um, so. thank you. That's that's very helpful. Um, so I think generally the other question is then, you know, tax equity investors have become somewhat com comfortable with renewable energy projects uh, as those have become more mature. 
what do you see, having looked at those a lot, what do you see as the analog or the, the things that need to change with the CO2 capture area that would lead for more tax equity investors to be interested in this, um, in this space? Um, so hopefully the, the final regulations help. Again, if some, if some transactions could get done, um, you, you know, everybody feels better about things once they see somebody else do it. So, you, you know, it's hard to go to your bank's credit committee and say, hey, I want us to go first to do this. And the bank says, well, we're, we're these conservative, you know, bankers. We don't, you know, we don't know about this technology. We're not doing this first. But if you say, okay, well, you know, five other deals have been done and they've been successful and everybody's made money and, you know, the, the tax planning and the technology all work, then, um, that, then banks get, get more comfortable. So I think final regulations, hopefully some, uh, you know, softening capture and then precedent transactions um, to, to show people this can be done. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, but it sounds like we need to move fast since the deadline is 2024. <laughs> yes, that, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. That, that, that is the challenge. We don't have much time. Um, and, uh, and these things are very complicated. And, uh, you know, um, and, and by the time we got precedent, we know the period is almost over. So. Yeah. Um, so the audience also had um, some clarification questions on you know, you're a very helpful example, but I think it's, it's just quite a complex process um, in terms of what the difference is uh, between post and pre-flip uh, or yeah, pre-flip and post-flip. And then, um, yep. and then namely, uh, how, how does it actually work in terms of going from the um, tax equity part to the, to the cash conversion? Or is that? Um. I'm not, uh, so, I mean, so, so pretty, so I, what, just think of flip as, you, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm going to, I think I might've said it, but I'll, I'll put a, an after tax return out there, but I don't want people to latch onto that and expect what they're going to get. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say it's a 10% after tax rate of return, right? So the flip would happen upon um, the tax of the investor achieving a 10% after tax rate of return. And then it would go from, you know, having the very large, uh, share of the tax benefits and the cash to, to only 5%. Um, so that, that's the, the pre and post, um, you know, flip. Obviously, you don't want the flip to happen before the end of year 12, because then the tax equity investor won't get, won't get all the tax credits and, you know, the, the, your the transaction is not fully efficient. So you want to kind of ideally set that hurdle for when the flip occurs to be be you know projected to be right about the same time the 12 year tax credit period ends um, so I hope, hope that's helpful is there more Claire is there, is there more I can clarify there what else um, no I sorry, I'm just checking into the questions um, yeah I, I think that was that's helpful um, and then I mean you you highlighted that you can delegate the entity that uh, benefits from the tax credit uh, on a yearly basis. So um, there's kind of some flexibility there. Right. Um, so you, for instance, you, you could have the tax equity partnership be, be the, be the party that's disposing of the, uh, of the, of the CO2, right? So mm -hmm. in my example, um, the tax equity partnership owned the carbon capture equipment you could instead put it as the party disposing of a CO2 and have that, that, that be where the tax equity investor comes in and that be the partnership. And, you know, as to where it's better to put it, um, you know, which position is going to be perceived as having less risk? Is there, is there less risk to explain mm -hmm. to a credit committee if you are owning the carbon capture equipment or if you're doing the disposal? Um, so that, that, but there may be other, as we get more, you know, experience with this, maybe other factors that people will figure out as to play into where to put the, uh, the tax credit. So. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, we have a question from Rafael Bros. Um, hearing about uh, contraction in the traditional solar and wind um, TE market, which is making it difficult for some projects to get financed. Is, would we see the, the same kind of dynamic here? 
Yes. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad that question was asked. I'm glad you you, you raised it. Um, that is very important to note. So uh, right now, uh, the banks are projecting loan losses due to COVID-19, unrelated to tax, equity, renewables, uh, ESG. You know, just generic loan losses on you know credit cards and automobile leases and mortgages and you know whatever else. Um, and so there, so because of COVID-19 and the economic contraction, they're projecting loan losses, right? Then they take those loan losses and they say, well, given those loan losses, how much tax appetite do we have? Due to these loan losses uh, that from the COVID-19, projected loan losses from COVID-19, again, the banks haven't lost this money yet, but just in their forecast of what the future looks like, um, they're not showing themselves as paying taxes. So they don't want, because of the loan losses, will exceed their profits. So they don't want to invest in tax credits. So for that reason, most of, really all the banks are pretty much out of the, the tax equity market. Um, uh, so wind and solar is not getting financed, much less 45 cubes. So it's a very tough time uh, for sponsors who need to raise tax equity to monetize tax credits. Um, this is less of a problem for the insurance companies because the insurance companies aren't lenders. Uh, so, you know, they're less susceptible to the, you know, to the uh, economic downturn, uh, but it is, a, it is a real problem. So in addition to the uncertainty and the hesitation around 45Q generally, that would be there even if the economy was going great, uh, we also have COVID-19 and the economic impact of that putting yet another uh, you know, hurdle to getting uh, 45Q tax equity deals done. Wow, okay. So another reason to extend that deadline, perhaps. <laughs> right, that, 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 that takes Congress. So uh, hopefully yeah. it does get extended. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll know more in November. <laughs> uh, so another question came in asking whether small, um, small groups of CO2 capture systems yeah, th that are below the, the required size could pool their capture to, to total that minimum requirement um, and potentially benefit from those, um, the tax credit? It, it, yeah, so at, uh, under the proposed regulations, which are just proposed, the answer is no, but a number of taxpayers uh, made that same comment um, and, and, and made it pretty forcefully. Um, so uh, you know, the IRS is going to have to take a hard look at that uh, as they finalize the regulations uh, because they're obligated to consider the comments. That doesn't mean they're obligated to adopt all the comments, mm -hmm. but they're obligated to at least, you know, consider them and have a, you know, a rational response to them. So the IRS will have to come up with a rational response. In some, um, you know, informal discussions with IRS attorneys, they've indicated they might be receptive to that. That was a very qualified uh, response. So, so we will see. So there, there's some hope, uh, but it remains to be determined. Mm, interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, I was curious if you had any kind of political context or background to, to uh, you know, color, um, color the 45Q tax credit passing and, and, the, and the most recent update, in particular when knowing that having tax equity investors is so difficult. Um, you know, what do you think is the thinking around that? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, um, I mean, it was passed in 2018 before COVID-19. So I think there was, you know, some more optimism about tax equity investors. Uh, Congress doesn't really understand tax equity. So they, they you, know, you know, they may not have thought a whole lot about it. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, for by, you know, people in the, uh, you know, the carbon reduction, uh, uh, you know, industry. I guess the other thing about 45Q is it's, it's essentially something that both Democrats and Republicans can agree upon. So it's sort of a, a common ground. It appeals to, to both sides of the, you know, environmental uh, debate uh, because it does help uh, you know, to some extent subsidize, you know, a coal plant or a natural gas plant that's an, an emitter. Um, and so if you want to keep coal and natural gas plants running, uh, you support this, but then it does also have carbon reduction. Uh, so if you're concerned about climate change, 
and the level of carbon in the world, um, it, it, it also facilitates that. So it's, it's a, um, a bit of a, of, a, of a meeting point for the two sides of the debate. Thank you very much, David. I think we're at time, but this was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you for your questions. Yes. Thank you, David. Thank you, Clea, for an excellent presentation. Uh, very detailed. And accordingly, this will be put onto our YouTube channel afterwards so that people can review. We also had a couple of questions I noticed in the chat with people looking for kind of a quick primer on 45Q that they could share internally. Um, so something that we could think of as a potential share for a post-event email. Um, good, so speaking of post-event, um, our next event is going to be about uh, economic assessments and life cycle assessments held in two weeks featuring Professor Fulker Sick from the University of Michigan and, and, and other speakers as well. So looking forward to seeing you there. And uh, I would also advise that you should keep in mind that we are going to be running another survey of uh, internal to air miners to get a better feel for how we're interacting with each other and the relationships that we're developing. We had our big uh, user survey a couple of months ago. Following on to that, we'd like to really drill, drill down to some more qualitative thoughts and be on the lookout for that email as well. Other than that, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to keep the Zoom line open as usual for another 15 minutes or so for people who want to hang out, get to know one another, and break into separate Zoom rooms. So until, if, feel free to drop off if you like. We'll, we'll stop the recording. But otherwise, uh, looking forward to seeing you here and at more Airminers events.